Welcome to the September 2021 Plant Lovers Tour. Um, as has been mentioned, the topic is pollinator plants for the home garden. Um, I'm, there are several families that are really outstanding um, for the numbers of plants that are good pollinator plants. And one of them is the um, Aster family. It's the family we used to know as the composite family, the compositae. Um, and they are called the composite family because what we think of as a single flower is actually a collection of many small flowers. Each of these um, petals on the purple cone flower is a separate flower and, and then each little flower in the, um, the, the petals are known as ray flowers and then the little flowers on the center of the flower are the disc flowers. You can see that more clearly in the zinnia, which is also the same family, you see the, the little disc flowers are these little five petaled yellow ones in the center. And then the um, ray flowers are the things we generally call petals, but um, they all have petals. Um, the uh, big broad um, ray flowers, um, these, on this case, these big purple uh, flowers, um, act both as the eat at Joe's sign, attracting pollinators visually to the flower, but they also serve as a landing pad for bigger pollinators like, um, you know, a swallowtail butterfly. Um, but the purple cone flower, flowers and the garden hybrids are not only superb plants for pollinators, but the finches and other seed-eating birds make use of the seeds once the flowers are um, done blooming. Um, this, as you can see, is a totally ordinary looking purple cone flower. It's many generations removed from the original seed strain, which was purple giant? Ruby. Ruby giant. Thank you, Tim. Um, and it's September 1st. They're still heavily in bloom. Um, so even though it's not some special delicious color, uh, we like the fact that it's still blooming strongly at this time of the year. Um, and we're, we're actually trying to remove it from this part of the garden and, um, and it keeps on coming back from seed and these plants that are in bloom now are probably all ones that germinated from seed this summer. Um, now most and wild plants who haven't been, wild plants which haven't been improved by plant breeders um, are generally perfectly good pollinator plants. But um, when uh, flowers are made, uh, you know, bred or whatever to produce double flowers and such, then often the parts that would produce nectar and pollen are, have become the additional petals. And so they offer um, little or no food for pollinators. Um, and then they also usually don't set seed. This is one of those modern, um, sort of, I, I think they remind me of an ice cream cone, um, um, cone flowers where all the little disc flowers in the center have become, um, more like the ray, ray flowers. And so it, I don't see any evidence of, of pollen in, in there. So these tend not to be visited by pollinators or birds later on. Um, the aster family, the composite family is a huge one and we might get to see um, other examples out in the garden. But, um, you know, I mentioned zinnias. Zinnias are really great um, pollinator plants. Um, they're easy from seed. You can direct sow the seeds in the garden after frost in the spring. And then usually by August or so, they're a little bit tired looking, but you can sow another batch of seed in July or early August and they'll bloom real nicely up until frost. Um, goldenrod is also in that family. The um, inflorescences are quite a bit different than this kind of arrangement, but it is in that same family. And these late blooming things are really important to um, monarchs so they can fuel up on their flight back to Me Mexico where they spend the winter. Um, botanists and plant taxonomists have a term 
um, another damn yellow composite because there are so many members of this family that have these daisy-like yellow flowers. This is a uh, superb sunflower from the color trials, Suncredible, and one of our native sylphiums, which are very similar to sunflowers, but hopefully we'll get to see them out in the garden. A couple other things in this bed. Um, Verbena bonariensis, um, you know, what Tony Avent likes to call verbena on a stick is a true verbena. Uh, bonariensis referring to Buenos Aires, meaning good air. Uh, um, well, that's what the city is named after. And it used to be a better plant because the foliage used to stay clean um, all summer long. But the moment they start to get ratty, you can either do a light cleanup on them and cut these old seed heads out, or I'm actually going to take a few steps up here and show you how it would handle a plant that has gotten really raggedy. Just cut the whole thing to the ground, not to eliminate it, but to revitalize it. In about a week, it'll have new shoots and probably a lot of bloom in uh, by mid-fall or so, maybe even a little bit earlier. I always like, you know, when I tell somebody to cut things to the ground, the, people always ask, do you mean to the ground? It's so always like to demonstrate that I do indeed mean cut it to the ground. And you get rid of all this ugly raggedy growth and it'll soon refreshen. There's a wonderful little member of the mint family here. Now people get, uh, you know, terrified when you mention the mint family, but the mint family is a huge one. It includes, of course, the true mints in the genus Mentha. I think there's, what, 700 genera in the mint family, so it's a huge one. But it includes things like salvia, uh, so many of our culinary herbs, rosemary, lavender, thyme, sage. And sage is a, a salvia. And, and now lavender is, I mean, uh, rosemary has been reclassified as a salvia. But this little white blooming plant is salvia, no, lordy, I'm sorry, calamintha, meaning pretty mint. Calamintha nepeta, and the name might be changed now, but names get changed back and forth. And it's been in bloom all summer. It's about 12 to 18 inches tall. And on this cloudy, breezy day that's trying to rain, um, we don't see pollinators visiting it, but it's um, normally lots of bees and wasps are visiting these flowers. Now, the idea of attracting um, bees and wasps and other pollinators to our garden might strike fear in people, but they're focused on the flowers. You can stand right next to them for hours and they're never going to come and bother you. Our, I believe that's one of our big carpenter bees there that look just like bumblebees, but are, you know, easily twice the size of a bumblebee. And there's a great big wasp here that was going after that bumblebee, but it's probably also here to drink nectar from those flowers. All right, we're gonna move on to uh, another part of the garden, a few steps away. You can see this uh, butterfly visiting the coneflower up there. I think that's a uh, pipevine swallowtail with that big flush of blue on the lower pair of wings. I'm standing in front of Sarissa japonica, the Japanese snow rose. I don't know why rose, other than the cultivated forms, have little double flowers that are um, maybe look a little bit like a rose. Um, but sometimes the wild form of a plant is the better plant for uh, pollinators. Um, this, this is the wild type of Sarissa fetida. You see the flowers are tiny, but if this was a sunny day, there'd be 50 or more bumblebees on this plant and some other pollinators as well. And um, a nice feature of this plant, it's in bloom from late spring uh, and it's still blooming on September 1st. So never a showstopper in the garden, but always uh, an absolute superb plant for 
feeding our native pollinators. And, you know, though this was an example where the wild type was superior to the cult cultivated forms, I want to talk about um, this very common plant, Abelia, Glossy Abelia, um, now available in many selections, um, with many of them with colorful foliage. I think this is confetti. No, kaleidoscope. No, it's not kaleidoscope. I'm sorry. What? Hopley. There's so many uh, variegated um, abelias available nowadays, I, I can't keep them straight. But Abelia grandiflora is a hybrid between two species, and one of them is Abelia uh, chinensis, the Chinese Abelia, whereas Abelia grandiflora is evergreen, Abelia chinensis is deciduous, and in the winter, it even though I love most trees and shrubs in their leafless winter form, uh, Abelia chinensis is this very scrappy looking plant in the winter. So it's not a plant that's widely produced by the nursery trade. And part of it is uh, the plant I cut this off of was probably eight foot tall. So much taller than a lot of the compact selections of the hybrid Abelia grandiflora. But if you want a single plant that's super superb for butterflies, Abelia chinensis is hard to beat. It's also powerfully fragrant. I don't know if you have sc scratch and sniff uh, video screen at, at home, but you, if you do, you can probably smell it. Very, very strongly fragrant, maybe even more so in the evening. And uh, again, just like Abelia grandiflora, it's in bloom for um, months and months through the summer and early fall. Um, I know we stuck cuttings of this, so it's something we'll probably have out on our plant cart or in the giveaway or plant sale at some point. Okay, we'll head up to the uh, perennial border area. We are now in the new border just before you get to the main perennial border. Um, I do need to talk about this plant down here. It looks very much like a verbena, um, but it's not. It's not even related to verbena. It's heliotrope. Um, the genus is heliotropium. The common name is heliotrope. Um, it's actually in the borage family, so related to comfrey and forget-me-nots and lungwort pulmonaria. Um, it, it, I guess you could distinguish it from um, verbena, I don't know, this is rather small detail, um, but the, inf it, the inflorescence is three-parted, but then each third, uh, the inflorescence is coiled around, and this whole arrangement is called the cyme, C-Y-M-E, and this particular type where the branch curls under like that is known as a scurpoid cyme, and if you're thinking that sounds a little bit like a scorpion, that's exactly what it's referring to, um, the way a scorpion curves its tail over its back. Um, but a little five-petaled flower, just like other members in the borage family, um, it's been in bloom probably since May, if not May, June, and it's fully winter hardy, completely disappears in the winter, this great big swath might be one plant that get quite wide. Um, um, continues blooming no matter how dry it is. We're really hoping it rains today. We're out here sacrificing ourselves to the thunderstorm that might pop up. Um, but um, on a sunny day, it's covered with all sorts of pollinators, especially butterflies. One of my favorite butterflies seems to really enjoy it, the little uh, common buckeye butterfly. Um, so, you know, if you have an edge of a bed where you can have three, four, five feet of uh, a ground covering plant, um, it doesn't take, you know, it's, it's only about t eight, 10 inches tall. Unfortunately, it doesn't have the uh, wonderful fragrance of the uh, maybe better known uh, uh, half hardy or tropical heliotrope. Which species is that though? It's Heliotropium amplexicoli. Amplexicoli is a really long word. 
and it just means clasping the stem. Um, Kali is stem. And well, you know, I don't see that it's so distinctly clasping the stems, but you'll have to ask the botanists that gave it that name, you know, probably a couple hundred years ago. But a plant I wouldn't be without if my goal was to have pollinator plants in the garden. Well, even if you're not interested in pollinator plants, it's a carpet of uh, sort of blue lavender all summer long. And it's normally more heavily in bloom than this, but it's late in the season for something that's been blooming since May. Um, oh, here's a plant of Abelia chinensis. It's a young plant, so it hasn't gotten eight foot tall, but it's blooming with uh, Phlox paniculata, the summer Phlox. Um, summer Phlox paniculata is in the Polymoniaceae, which is a family, you know, it's, it's neither a mint or a um, aster family member, but a long floral tube. And so as you might imagine, it's something very popular with butterflies with their long uh, proboscis that they dip into the flower. I, I suspect, Tim, do you see hummingbirds visit flocks? I can't remember if you. Something I do see would be the hummingbird moth. Oh, the hummingbird moth, which is the most marvelous, yeah. magical creature because I hope you all have experienced the hummingbird moth. It moves just like a hummingbird and you'll stand there looking at it, not being able to decide what you're seeing, whether you're looking at a hummingbird or a moth, but it has, you know, antennas like a moth, whereas a hummingbird, of course, wouldn't ever. But the um, flocks are, you know, the, these su summer blooming flocks, flocks paniculata, um, just goes on for months in the summer. Um, Standing next to a four o'clock, which is not yet open, I've always found that four o'clocks open more about seven o'clock, but they are a plant that the hummingbirds really enjoy, and they'll still be open um, the following morning. Um, and so the, the four o'clocks can be a little weedy because every seed they drop will be a plant next year. Um, it is a great plant for um, hummingbirds. And when they do open up, they're very fragrant. We can continue down the border a few more steps. Um, I had, oh, well, I can gather up all of this. Uh, this is my mint family bouquet. Um, you know, an, an, I mentioned another member of the mint family are uh, th is the genus Salvia. Uh, this is a white form of the typically blue mealy cup sage, which is Salvia um, farinacea, referring to farina. Again, going back to the common name of mealy cup sage. The little calyx is sort of has a fuzzy gray outer covering to it. And um, some of the salvias are great for bumblebees and some are great for uh, hummingbirds. And uh, things like the mealy cup sage with a broad lip are generally visited by um, uh, bumblebees and other insects. Whereas the uh, salvia with the long tubular flower, as you would guess, are more commonly visited by hummingbirds. And then when you cross the mealy cup sage with another salvia, salvia longus spicata, you get these hybrids um, with a long spike of a more almost violet indigo blue flower. And their first one was um, indigo spires, which tried to get about eight foot tall, but always fell over. So then they irradiated that one and produced um, mystic spires, which only gets about four feet tall, and this is mystic spires. And then there's a very similar one, Big Blue, which we're trying for the first time this year. And, um, and then, you know, the plant breeders have bred even shorter ones, but uh, th this type of salvia hybrid will bloom all summer long. And, uh, you know, how many more hundreds of time am I gonna say it this hour? If it was a sunny day, these flower spikes would be bobbing up and down with all the bumblebees that are vi visiting the flowers. 
Um, they are generally winter hardy in uh, zone seven, as are most forms of the mealy cup sage. Um, I do have a couple other mint family members in this bouquet. Um, and if you grew just one pollinator plant, or maybe I should say, if I grew just one pollinator plant, I would grow this hybrid basil. This is um, a hybrid known as African blue. It's one you can use in the kitchen, but you wouldn't bother if you had, you know, Italian basil or Thai basil, because this is not very fragrant. But, um, you know, probably more loved by our native bumblebees and other pollinators, including honeybees, which are not native, um, than almost any other plant. Um, it is not winter hardy. It is a tender perennial, so it will live for years if it's protected from frost. Um, it, it, it is about a, one of the easiest plants to root, so we always take a few inside um, and overwinter it at home. I overwintered in a sunny window, but so easy to root. And again, it's blooming all summer. It's fairly drought tolerant. It's not one, a plant that grumbles about dry weather, you know, when it first turns dry, it just keeps on going on. And um, I never see any blue in it. The foliage is sort of purpley. Uh, the flowers are slightly purpley white, but it's a hybrid between two species of basil, one being a purple foliaged Italian basil and the other one um, a species from Africa. Um, very different from uh, the salvias and basils, monardas are also in the mint family. And these are a um, new series that are there. I think you can find these readily in garden centers. They're in the B series, B double E, you know, like be mine, be true, be this, be that. Um, and they get about 18 or 24 inches tall. Um, this is their first summer in the uh, perennial part of our um, color trials, um, trial, trial garden. And they're still heavily in bloom in September. Now, next year, maybe they'll start earlier and be done earlier, but um, a long tubular flower. So very often, you know, the flowers are pretty long. Um, so pollinated by um, certainly hummingbirds and butterflies, but often bees will um, make use of these long tubular flowers and they're too fat to and their tongues are too short to pollinate from the open mouth of the flower, but they'll cut a hole in the side of the flower. Uh, robber bees are sometimes referred to. And another absolutely superb um, pollinator plant, the mountain mints, again in the mint family. Um, and it's a small genus. Um, many of them are spreaders. So not for the very small garden, but if you have room, they will bloom for months. And it's like going to a insect zoo when they're in bloom, because you'll see, you know, almost every type of pollinator that visits flowers, um, visiting these flowers. This is Pycnanthemum muticum. It has these silvery bracts below the inflorescence. Um, they're a little less silvery. Uh, right now because they got damp in that shower we had about an hour ago. The flowers are tiny. You can It's mostly done blooming, but you can see these small white flowers here. Um, um, and so it's not, by this time of the year, it's pretty much done blooming, but it's also pretty in the winter when it sheds all these leaves. It sort of looks like the heads of some of the sedums that we leave for winter interest. Oh, and um, yeah, and the foliage is is very, very minty. Um, it always reminds me a little bit more of Penny Royal, that minty smell that's a little bit different than peppermint or spearmint. Of course, we, can, we can't really talk about um, pollinator plants without talking about lantana. Uh, the majority of lantanas are not winter hardy in zone seven, but there are a number of selections which are. 
uh, this bright orange and yellow one is one called um, Star Landing. Um, it's not as tall growing as um, Miss Huff, but um, and it's a clearer orange and yellow than Miss Huff. And a very atypical um, lantana is this one right in front of me. It's Lantana trifolia. And back in the spring, it didn't cooperate, but today it is. Um, well, this one isn't being all that cooperative. But um, in general, there's a whirl of three leaves at each node and three inflorescences generally at each node. And then they're followed up by these very colorful fruit. The fruit's almost showier than the flowers. And um, gee, they look a lot like Calicarpa. Well, Calicarpa and Lantana are in the same family. They're in the Verbena family. Um, and this is one that has never been winter hardy for us, but it always comes back from seed. And we don't do anything to encourage it. We just uh, enjoy it where it pops up. But you can sort of get an idea of, of everything being in threes on, on some of these stems. So Lantana trifolia. While we're on the subject of members of the Verbena family, um, this is Verbena stricta or possibly Ver Verbena uh, zutha, uh, a native Verbena that's tall growing. My understanding from what I read is that um, Verbena stricta is uh, very drought tolerant. In the perennial border, it always seems to be happier in the less dry parts than in the real dry parts of the arboretum. Um, but there, there's another um, tall growing verbena that's native to the East Coast that's um, more typically of wet uh, spots. And I'm forgetting its name right now, but I should step back and just talk about this. Everybody grows verbena, but they're usually the hybrid ones, which are often very, very lovely plants, but not always all that reliably winter hardy. But this bright, pink one here represents just wild type Verbena canadensis, and it's very winter hardy. Um, it often will bloom a good part of the winter as well. Um, it's not, and doesn't necessarily live forever, but it comes back from seed here and there. Though um, with good drainage, the plant will go on for quite a few years. Another mint family member, Looks like it should be a salvia, but it's in the genus Lepitina, um, spelled pretty much like it sounds, L-E-P-E-C-H-I-N-A. Um, and it's Lepitina hastata. Hastata is referring to a sort of arrow or shield shape, and the leaves are very much that way. Um, Short-lived perennial that refreshes itself by producing enough seedlings. Um, but it's, it's late to start blooming, but then it goes up, I think, most of the way to um, frost. Um, that long tubular flower, I'm, I'm sure, gets visited by um, hummingbirds. Uh, yuccas bloom at various times of the year. This is just um, yucca gloriosa. There's a flower spike over there that's mostly done and another one starting. And, I think there's some very specific pollinators that visit um, yucca flowers. And you might think, well, they probably don't occur in the East Coast since these plants are native to the Southwest. Well, no, the, the, the yucca gloriosa and several other species are native to the East Coast. So if they have specific pollinators, I'm sure they're hanging out somewhere near here. Um, in the background, we have a butterfly bush, um, a pink cascade. It's looking rather pale today, but the butterfly bushes get their name, obviously, because they are such good plants for, for butterflies. In the back of the perennial border is the giant ironweed, um, Vernonia. Um, the name seems to be a little bit in flux right now, whether it's Vernonia gigantea or Vernonia altissima. Altissima 
meaning very tall. And it certainly deserves both of those specific epithets. Um, and this is one named by Plantelite's nursery, um, Jonestown Giant. And it is a giant that's, that's about 14 feet tall. Um, and it, it's past its peak of bloom, but those flowers are highly favored by butterflies and other pollinators. And I, though we get an awful lot of seedlings of it, if we leave, leave uh, the seed heads on it, the seed heads are very beautiful in the winter. And some birds make use of their tiny seeds. Um, some Vernonias are, um, prefer a wet site and the perennial border is far from being a wet site, but obviously um, this giant ironweed um, does not have to be wet to thrive. Now, I've always wondered why it's called ironweed. I know it's even a small plant is very hard to pull out of the ground and I've always thought that might be why it gets its name of ironweed. The mallow family, the hibiscus family, is another family um, favored by pollinators. Um, we're standing in front of um, a member of that family, um, the uh, sleepy mallow, or I always knew it as uh, Scotchman's purse. Um, and it gets its name of Scotchman's purse because the flowers do not open. Um, so if you do open up the flowers, it looks like a very typical hibiscus flower with all the reproductive parts fused together in the center. And I think all members of that family have five petals if it's the typical wild type. I'm doing a really good job of mangling this, um, but it does have five petals. But despite not opening it, you can watch big bumblebees force their way into the closed flower and I guess go run around the flower and collect nectar and then exit the flower. Um, it has the constitution of a lantana in that it loves hot sunny places, it's very drought tolerant, and it just blooms for months and months. Um, that family also includes um, the flowering maples which are butylon. Um, this is an example of an abutilon. This is orange hot lava. Um, you know, I don't know if it's one that Plantelites Nurseries introduced, but it's certainly one that they sell. And um, it's, it's one that's winter hardy. And these flowers, despite their pendant nature, are visited by hummingbirds and uh, you know, I get, uh, almost everything I've talked about today has been in bloom since May. Um, but these real long blooming plants really are useful for uh, creating gardens full of uh, flowers all year long. Oh, it's set of fruit. And that's a pretty typical fruit in that family. And of course, my Probably favorite member of that of the mallow family, the hibiscus family, is um, okra, and there's lots of um, yeah. Th there are lots of uh, okra relative in the perennial border. The golden hibiscus that has a probably six inch wide pale yellow flower, but um, on a typical summer day, they're glorious in the morning and sort of faded by mid afternoon, but. Um, we don't have a hibiscus in bloom, and certainly it's the wild type hibiscus that um, are visited by pollinators, and not so much the huge, high, highly hybridized ones. But if you think of the Texas star, the big red wild hibiscus, those big petals, again, like in the zinnias I mentioned earlier, are sort of landing pads for a large butterfly to land on that petal and then nectar from the center of the flower. So, you know, we have some hibiscus back there, but um, they're done, pretty much done blooming. It is September after all. Okay. Oh, but we are standing in front of some cannas. And um, 
this is the canna with a million names. Um, we knew it as Bengal Tiger, and now it seems like the correct name or preferred name is Canna striata. These great big um, hybrid cannas are, are not visited, they're not their first choice um, for, but on the part of hummingbirds, but when you get into the cannas that are um, smaller flowered and closer to the wild type or even the wild type cannas, these small flowered cannas are highly favored by hummingbirds and um, they will just bloom um, all summer long. Uh, this is um, a subtle colored one known uh, with the cult of our name of flaming hot kebabs. Um, nice cheerful one. Okay. And on to what else? Well, you know, um, they're not, not in bloom today. Um, oh, I can. Um, but we should, I think I dropped my, I did. Um, the uh, milkweeds, the Asclepius, um, are, you know, also butterfly weed is a common name for some of them get this canna out of the way. This is Asclepius syriacus. And syriacus does sound like Syria because whoever named this plant thought it was a uh, Syrian native, but no, it's a North American native. Um, and it has sort of beigey pink flowers, so not super colorful, but it's a big fat head of these super fragrant flowers. And when they're in bloom, the big carpenter bees and bumblebees are running around on the outside of the flowers, making use of the nectar. Um, but unless you have a big meadow and, you know, acres and acres of meadow, I, I would not plant this species of Asclepius because you see all the stems of it, it's spreading underground and it's now spread, you know, about 60 feet in the perennial border. Um, and that's its typical seed pod there. And despite having so much of it, we almost never, Tim's my superstar today, you almost never, we, well, we almost never see the monarch butterflies make use of this foliage. I'd, I'd feel a lot better about this plant taking up so much territory in the perennial border if, if the monarch caterpillars were making use of it. I just saw one over there on that, that tuberosa. Yeah. I need to bring it over here. Oh, the caterpillar. Yeah, yeah but two other um, species of Asclepius that are easy plants to have in a, in a small garden because they do not spread underground but are, form a distinct clump are the orange butterfly weed, Asclepius tuberosa. Tuberosa referring to the tuberous root. Um, you know, they first bloom late spring, early summer, and then they, the plants can get a little bit raggedy, but then they'll bloom again this time of year. Um, certainly when they grow along the sides of highways and they get mowed down, they're not really phased by that. They just regrow and bloom again. And then um, Asclepius incarnata, um, I think incarnata referring to flesh um, because of the fleshy pink color. It's often described as being fragrant. I've never just um, discovered a fragrance to it. Now, there are garden selections of Asclepius incarnata, like Ballerina and Ice Ballet. And I've grown those, had them last a year or a couple years and then disappear from the garden. Um, this is a subspecies of Asclepius incarnata and I, it hasn't resurfaced up here yet today. And I tried to look up that name online before showing up for this program and I just could not dig it up. But there's a subspecies of Asclepius incarnata with a fuzzy leaf and this isn't really visually fuzzy, but it is very rough. Whereas things like Ice Ballet and Ballerina have a smooth, almost slick leaf. And I have found that um, if this is that subspecies with the hairy or rough leaf, that um, um, the plants go on for years and years. Um, 
And I, the plants that I've planted in other gardens and friends have planted in their gardens came from the North Carolina Botanic Garden. So that could be a good source. We had a lot of this for sale last year, but the seed didn't get sown last fall. But we'll try again to sow more seed this fall and um, make it available through our plant sales and such. But this time of year, we do start to see the monarch caterpillars on the foliage. So the flowers are um, super good for um, pollinators. But then, of course, when you're planting most of the most any of these um, milkweeds, you're also supporting monarch butterflies. Um, and, you know, that's something we can do in our home gardens and collectively we can make a difference. What else? Oh, and uh, yeah, we do have, yeah, way up there is a flower on a um, hybrid coral bean, Erythrina. If you're in the medical field, you might recognize um, that red blood cells are erythrocytes, while eryth erythro is referring to red. And I think that um, deserves the uh, generic name erythrina, but this is a hybrid between our native herbaceous perennial, which grows sort of like a baptisia, and a large South American tree, um, the crybaby tree, uh, erythrina cristigali. And it blooms on and off all summer. Um, and a few feet to its right is just starting to open up another member of the legume family, the P and B fa family that as also blooms on and off all summer. That's Cesalpinia, named for a, an Italian physician, Cesalpini. Um, and, you know, we all know the problem with common names. It, its common name is Bird of Paradise, and obviously not even closely related to the other plant commonly called Bird of Par Paradise, which is that plant, tropical plant with the banana-like foliage, um, Strelitzia, but both, you know, beautiful summer blooming plants, I suspect both visited by um, pollinators. Hummingbirds. What? Hummingbirds. Hummingbirds, yeah, that would make sense. Um, and the, the um, Cesalpinia, the bird of paradise, I wish it was more open because you see those red filaments, those are the stamens, and they're several inches long, so you figure it has to be a good-sized creature like a hummingbird or a large butterfly that manages to get the pollen from the tips of those stamens onto the stigma of the plant. You can see a number of seed pods up there. Um, so, you know, not it wouldn't. Neither one of them would be the core of your pollinator garden, but they would add some extreme beauty and, and drama too to any garden. Well, you know, let me let me do this. There's a uh, spider lily and a, another um, another case where the common name spider lily is used on several different genera. Um, this is like chorus and then the uh, hymena callus are also called spider lilies and other names as, as well. But this is not a true lily, it's in the amaryllis family, but you see uh, six petals and it looks like six stamens. You see with the, uh, the anther at the end, which bears the pollen. And then uh, I'm gonna have, I'd have to put on my, yeah, here, here's the stigma, the female part. So, you know, this is very much like the arrangement on that bird of paradise flower up there where the stamens have these really long filaments with the little pollen bearing anther at the end and then the really long um, um, stigma. Um, and so, you know, a, a tiny little pollinator that visited the center of the flower wouldn't affect pollination, but if you were like a big butterfly flapping your wings out here as you nectared, you probably could manage to get some of this pollen on this stamen. Oh, plants are endlessly fascinating. We started off talking about the purple coneflowers and that they were a composite and 
what is now known as the Astor family. And there are many Rudbeckias that are often referred to as the orange cone flowers. Again, that exact same uh, arrangement of um, ray flowers and disc flowers. But this is uh, Rudbeckia triloba. Um, yeah, I, f I see a leaf down here. Um, as you get further up on the stems, the leaves tend to be unlobed like that, but the leaves lower down on the stems are, are trilobed. And for us, it's, a, it's certainly not a perennial. Um, the seedlings that come up now will be a, a rosette all through the winter months and then bloom now. So that would make it a biennial where it's a rosette one season and flowers the next and then dies. But um, a good pollinator plant, um, and the, you know, just like Rudbeckia fulgida, the, um, the finches and other seed-eating birds will make use of the, the seeds. So, um, you know, if you ever get Rudbeckia triloba in your garden, you'll probably have it forever because it's a fairly prolific seeder, um, but entirely worthwhile. Good cut flower as well. Another uh, family we haven't touched on that is, has many members that are, uh, do I need to start, keep on going? Okay, I'm a really bad um, person in front of the camera. But another family we hadn't touched on yet today that's a source of many really good pollinator plants is the Umble family. Now we've, we've talked about cymes and other um, types of inflorescences today. Well, an Umble is, um, just a one type of um, inflorescence. And may, maybe I should go back and uh, you define the term inflorescence. If you think of, well, here's a good example, a daylily. This is a single flower. This is not an inflorescence. But when you have a whole bunch of smaller flowers in some sort of structured arrangement, that is an inflorescence. And when you um, Type that word, spell check will sure you want to say inflorescent, like inflorescent light bulbs. But um, there are many different um, types of inflorescences and it's, the, the terms are all referring to the arrangement, but an umbel is uh, a pretty distinct one um, in that you have a center point from which all the stems arise. arise. So it's a little bit like an umbrella almost, but that is the umble. So the umble family, the, uh, well, see, I know I was, the old name for the umble family was the umbelliferae, but decades ago, they decided to make all the families have the same suffix, which is perfectly reasonable. So they, most of the families already had the suffix of ACA. Three more minutes. Three more minutes. Um, and so they changed the name to APACA. Yeah, APA, APA is parsley, I think. But this is fennel, and these tiny little flowers are great for pollinators, especially tiny things. You'll often, I'll often um, notice with my old eyes, I can see that there's tiny little creatures flying around, but they're too small for me to see what they are. But um, one of our showiest native butterflies, the eastern black swallowtail. Oh, you see one? Oh, Tim, you're an angel. Yeah, um, eastern black swallowtail, caterpillar, they only eat members of the APACA. And there's not all that many native umbels um, for um, one of these creatures to eat. And don't worry, I will return it to its breakfast or dinner. Um, and they look a lot like a, a monarch butterfly, but if you saw the two together, you wouldn't ever confuse them. Um, but if, you, if you're getting dressed in the morning and you didn't turn the light on and you were wearing caterpillars for your socks, you very well might end up with one of these and one monarch because they are pretty similar looking. But um, they only eat um, umbels and um, um, they love dill, they love parsley. I don't use a lot of either one in the kitchen, um, but I would plant them in the garden just to feed these guys. 
I can, I'm gonna see if I can annoy him enough to make him stick out of it, stick his osmerias out. They have these two horn-like projections that they'll stick out of their head if you bother them enough. I'm gonna stop bothering him. Um, and you know, osmer, I might not have the name right, but osme is referring to fragrance, just like the tea olive is osmanthus. And so they stick these things out. They look pretty fierce, but mostly, you know, if you were gonna eat it, you, they, they would taste or smell really bad. But I'll put that back on the plant. So another whole family. So the mint family, the composite family, the humble family um, are three super good families. What do you see? Oh, yes. Thank you, Tim. Um, now this is a plant that serves many purposes. This is garlic chives, Allium tuberosum. Showy plant this time of year, but any of the alliums that are summer blooming are highly valued by pollinators. Um, so you can use the garlic chives in the kitchen, but it's also, you know, all sorts of pollinators um, um, visit the flowers. Um, that might be, I think I should probably stop. I should probably stop. Um, yeah, I thank you very much for attending this. I am now going to go on a sabbatical and not use the word pollinator for about a month um, because I, it's, uh, I've worn a rut in my tongue saying, using that one word over and over again. If we have any questions now, uh, you can type them in the chat. I'll see if I can uh, relay oh, those to Doug. Tim got some other good treasures. Let's Another see. allium? Is that um, bubble? Uh, wow. senescence blocker. Okay. And senescence. See, a lot of people are thanking you. They really like the show. Good. Um, I'm going to scroll back in a little bit and see if there's any questions. Someone loved your caterpillar socks <laughs> reference. So there you go. Um, uh, well, but, uh, do you remember what Barb Fair said in the symposium on Saturday? What, what was it, that mulch is the underwear of the gardens? Yeah, yeah oh. I love that. Love that. We do have a question, Doug. Um, purple cone flower. Um, uh, do you leave purple cone flower to bloom and seed? Um, when do you cut it back at the end of the season after, after you've let it seed? Um, they, yeah, should, do I need to repeat the question? Yes, please. Okay, the question was, if you leave purple cone flower to flower and then seed, when do you cut it back? Um, I'll just say this, that though the orange cone flowers, the rudbeckias tend to look good, most of them tend to look good all winter, purple cone flower, by the time the finches have pulled all the seeds out of the seed heads, they look pretty shabby. And, you know, they're not really serving much purpose at that point, so I tend to cut them down then. They, you know, it doesn't matter to the plant when you cut them down, but they can look pretty shabby by then. Just leave them long after that seed uh, matures so the birds will eat it. Yeah. I got a question from Christine uh, who says, if you could only have one pollinator plant in your garden, what would it be? Uh, so I guess she's looking for favorites. Um, I, I have to go down to one. <laughs> if I went down to one, um, well, that's so hard, but I, I would say mountain mint, pycnanthemum. Um, you know, I, if I could give five, it'd probably be pycnanthemum, African blue basil, vitex. Um, probably the heliotrope. Was that five or is that four? Is that four? One more? Um, oh, I know, Manetia. This little vine that the hummingbirds like. Yeah, I, yeah. all the things I mentioned were more um, insect pollinated, but little th uh, this little vine, Manetia, for hummingbird plant. I mean, for hummingbirds. I don't know if you can see a there. Alex. Yeah. Yeah. I have a question about, is it okay to grow tropical milkweed for monarchs to feed on? Um, the person is probably referring to the blood flower, the Asclepius curasavica, which is, um, curasavica is refer to, referring to curacao. It is a Central South American native, often grown as an annual here, but not winter hardy. And there's some, 
controversy that it's not good to grow it out of where it's native for a couple reasons. Um, there are some pathogens that get transferred to monarchs, but the other issue is if they if monarchs have lush foliage to still lay eggs on, they might lay eggs on on that um, curasavica, um, and they might not mature soon enough to um, fly to Mexico. So I don't know what the final word is on that. I'd go online and look that up. And we have a question um, with Vernonia. Um, do you cut it to the ground after blooming or do you leave seed for the birds? Well, um, I'd like to, you know, I'm not the only one working on the perennial border. So some of the other people like to cut it down so we don't get millions of seedlings, which we do. I like to leave it, um, leave Vernonia um, for the birds to eat the seed. But I also think it's drop dead gorgeous in the winter. I like to leave herbaceous perennials through the winter if they're ones that are attractive at that time of the year. Some are, some aren't. All right, uh, that is about it for questions okay. in the chat. Okay. Uh, thank you everybody for coming out and thank you, Doug. One of the people here on the uh, chat says you're a rock star. Oh Lordy. So um, you certainly are a television star. All right, so thanks everybody. And we will see you next week at the next midweek. All righty, thank, thank you. you everybody. Hope everybody gets a good amount of rain.